Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Before Coffee. It's Thursday. It's Tragic News Thursday, according to Raj here. And we are gonna find out the awful things are going on, I guess. Uh, but it's not the end of the world. I'm sure there's also good things happening in the world, like some of my stories. Like Tragedy so let's, Thursday, let's go. Yeah. Tragedy. Let's get Tragic that started. Thursday. Tragic Thursday. Like a disc jockey. You gotta be thinking like a disc jockey all the time. <laughs> disc Girl, jockey. It's a Thursday. We're spinning the hits. All right. Today on Before Coffee, UK would be outlier with Russia if it left the ECHR, Law Society says. Maui is on fire. Turning food into a weapon, how Russia resorted to one of the oldest forms of warfare. Presidential candidate is assassinated in Ecuador. Cyprus begins treating island's sick cats with anti-COVID pills. And we remember Robbie Robertson has passed at the age of 80. Today, on August 10th, 2023, edition of Before Coffee. Destruction. Death and destruction. Death and destruction. <laughs> well, my stories oh. mostly are covering the kind of, I don't know. Governmental, societal things, I guess. Okay, first story. This is from Rowena Mason at the Whitehall Editor. The UK would be an international outlier along with Russia and Belarus if it left the European Convention of Human Rights, a leading law body has warned. After a senior minister signaled that the move could be an option to stop small boat crossings. Robert Jenrick, the immigration minister, said the government would do whatever is necessary, even if that meant pulling out of the ECHR, the 70-year-old plan, old pan-European treaty that protects human rights and political freedoms in the continent. His comments are an escalation of the government's previous statements that leaving the ECHR was not an immediate step if it was, it was going to take. It has insisted that it can deliver on Rishi Sunak's pledge to stop the boats within the convention. But the conservatives could dial up their rhetoric against the ECHR in order to create a dividing line with Labour before an election. With senior MPs telling the BBC they thought Sunak could fight a campaign pledged to leave. Pledging to leave. The Law Society, the professional body for solicitors in England and Wales, said that the small boat crossings by asylum seekers will not be tackled by leaving an extremely successful international agreement designed to protect individual rights and support political stability. Lubna Suja, its president, said leaving the ECHR would mean the UK would sit out as an outlier in Europe alongside only Russia and Belarus, who are already outside the convention. This would be using a sledgehammer to crack a nut, when the government already has a perfectly good nutcracker it can use. The Law Society said bringing down the, ba the case backlog for asylum application and tackling issues with the Legal Migration Act would be the way to address the problems with the system. Human Rights Group also expressed alarm. Sal Reynolds, head of the Asylum Advocacy of Freedom from Torture, said leaving the ECHR would, will not correct any of the failings of this government that have led to the record backlog in asylum claims, or the continued loss of life and waters around Europe. Yeah, it would only help people die faster, I think. We don't have to care about those, go those guys who don't believe in human rights. Charlie Falconer, the Labour peer who was just a sex secretary to Tony Blair's government says, Jenrick's suggestion was yet another example of the deliberate undermining of the law and lawyers by the government. Following the government's attacking lefty member of the profession for failures in their own immigration policy. The government's plan to send people to Rwanda for processing of their asylum claims is still facing a Supreme Court battle. The first flight was stopped at the 11th hour in June last year after an appeal to the European Court of Human Rights, which ensures that the rights enshrined in the Convention are upheld by its 46 signatory countries. It is separate from the EU, which the UK voted to leave in 2016. There are already calls from some within the Conservative Conservatives to withdraw from the ECHR. Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary, who is also a lawyer, has previously expressed a view that the UK should leave. On Times Radio, Jenrick would not rule out withdrawal from the convention, saying the government would do whatever is necessary. 
You can see from the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary and myself our total commitment to this challenge, he said. That's why we're working on every possible front. That's why we have produced the most comprehensive plan, I believe, of any European country to tackle this issue. And we'll do whatever is necessary ultimately to defend our borders and protect and bring order to our asylum system. Pressure pressed directly on whatever they could include leaving the ECR, he said. We will do whatever is required. Take whatever necessary action is needed. Later on Wednesday, a number 10 source sought to damage the suggestion that the UK would leave the ECHR. Our stop the Boats Act would deliver the changes necessary to reduce the incentives for people to risk their lives through illegal crossings or mating par party to the ECHR, the source said. Our world leading partnership with Rwanda is work will work alongside this as part of our plan to stop the boats. The Court of Appeal was clear that the policy of re relocating asylum seekers to a safe third country for the processing of their claims in a line is in line with the Refugee Convention and we remain confident in the legality of the partnership. Our focus now is on the next steps in our appeal. Generic gave his assessment as he announced that the government had struck a deal with Turkey to focus on coordinated actions to disrupt and dismantle people smuggling gangs. On Tuesday night, the government pronounced, announced the establishment of Operational Center of Excellence by the Turkish National Police and supported by the UK. The center would aim to strengthen collaboration between the National Crime Agency and Home Office Intelligence staff based in Turkey and their Turkish counterparts, the British government has said. So they don't like immigrant they don't like asylum seekers. They don't like illegal immigration, I guess. And uh I don't know, I don't understand this. It's not like their population is rising. You know, they're gonna need people. Oh, we have too much paperwork. Just make the paperwork easier. No, instead let's make it really hard for anybody to come here as they slowly die in the country they live in. Okay. Whatever. On to your story. We always get our xenophobia. Yep. Everybody different is weird. We don't want them here. They're going to drag down our whatever. Our karma yeah. or something. I don't know what the hell <laughs> they're talking about. I don't know. The language is weird. Hey, learn some new words. Experience. All right. So, on with Tragic Thursday. This is from Associated Press by Jennifer Sinko Kelleher, Audrey McAvoy, and Christopher Weber. Or is it Weber? Probably Weber. Wildfires on Maui kill at least six. A wildfire tore through the heart of the Hawaiian island of Maui in darkness on Wednesday, reducing much of the historic town to ash and forcing people to jump into the ocean to flee the flames. At least six people died, dozens were wounded, and 271 structures were damaged or destroyed. Flyovers Wednesday of the town of Lahaina by U.S. Civil Air Patrol and the Maui Fire Department showed the extent of the devastation, said Mahina Martin, a spokesman for the Maui County. The fires continued to burn Wednesday afternoon, fueled by strong winds from Hurricane Dora as it passed well south of the Hawaiian Islands. Officials feared the death toll could rise. Well, death tolls usually don't go down, do they? As winds diminished somewhat, some aircraft resumed flights, enabling pilots to view the full scope of the devastation. Aerial view from the coast of Lahina showed dozens of homes and businesses flattened, including on Front Street where tourists gathered to shop and dine. Smoking heaps of rubble lay piled high next to the waterfront. Boats in the harbor were scorched and gray smoke hovered over the leafless skeletons of charred trees. It's horrifying. I've flown I've flown here 50 years and I've never seen anything come close to that, said Richard Olston, a helicopter pilot for the tour company. We had tears in our eyes, the other pilots on board and the mechanics and, and, the, and me. Actor Governor Sylvia Luke said the flames wiped out communities and urged travelers to stay away. Well, yeah, don't go to Hawaii on vacation this year. Don't go there this at all. Not, they don't want you to go. <laughs> well, don't go to Maui. Well, you can go to Hawaii, but I'm sure that the bigger island and everybody else is handling refugees. Even though the big island is basically a bit volcano, right? People yeah, watch as the smoke volcano. and flames fill, yeah, right. Fill the air from the raging wildfires on Front Street and down. Oh, this is a picture. This is not a safe place to be, she said. People 
Okay. No blah, 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 let's skip that. The exact cause of the blaze couldn't be determined, but a number of factors, including high winds, low humidity, and dry vegetation, likely contributed to Mr. said Mr. Sorry, said Major General, our Mr. General, said Major General Kenneth Hera, Adjutant General of the Hawaii State Department of Defense. Experts said climate change is increasing the likelihood of more extreme weather. Climate change in many parts of the world is increasing vegetation dryness in large part because the temperatures are hotter. Said Erica Fleischman, director of the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute in Oregon State University. Even if you have had some amount of participation, if you have higher temperatures, things dry out faster. Wind-driven yep. conflagrations swept into the area with alarming speed and ferocity, blazing through the intersections and leaping across wooden buildings in the Lahina Town Center that dates to the 1700s and is on the National Register of Historic Places. Well, it's not anymore. It's destroyed. It was at a it was apocalyptic from what they ex they explained. Tyre Lawrence said of 14 cousins and uncles who fled the town and look, took refuge in her home and Pakalani, east of Lahina. Lahina resident Ki Kiamakutu Kupu was trying to loot was tying down loose was tying down loose objects in the wind and cultural center he runs in Lahina when his wife showed up on Tuesday afternoon and told them they needed to evacuate. Sorry, I'm just not awake yet. Right at the time things got crazy. The wind started picking up, said Kapu who added that they got out in the nick of time. Two blocks away, they saw a fire and billowing smoke. Kapu, his wife and friend, jumped into the pickup truck. By the time they turned around, our building was on fire, he said. It was that quick. Crews were battling three fires in Maui, in Lahina, South Maui's Kaid area, and in the mountainous island communities known as Upcountry. Said Mahina Martin, spokesperson for Maui County. And in the upcountry Kula area, at least two homes were destroyed Tuesday in a fire that engulfed about 1.7 square miles. County of, County of Maui Mayor Richard Bison Jr. said, There have been no reports of injuries or homes lost to these three wildfires burning on Hawaii's Big Island. Mayor Mitch Ross said Wednesday firefighters did extend, extinguish a few roof fires. The National Weather Service said that Hurricane Dora which was passing to the south of the island chain at a safe distance of 500 miles was partly to blame for the gusts above 60 miles per hour that knocked out the power, rattled homes, and grounded firefighting helicopters in Maui. The Coast Guard on Tuesday rescued 14 people, including two children, who had fled to the ocean to escape the fire and smoking conditions, the county said in a statement. Fires killed six people on Maui, but search and rescue operations continued and the number could rise, Bison said. Six patients were flown from Maui to the island of Oahu on uh, Tuesday night, said Speedy Bailey, regional director of Hawaii Life Flight. Speedy Bailey, man, that's a name. Hey, uh, an air ambulance company. Three of them had critical burns. They were taken to Straub Medical Center's burn unit and said the others were taken to the other Honolulu hospitals. At least 20 patients were taken to Maui Memorial Medical Center, he said. And there's more news there, and it's more about individual people, but long story, and oh, Maui, it's going to burn until it doesn't burn anymore, apparently. And it's more news from our hot, hot planet. Back to you. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's Hawaii for you. It's just a bit, it's a, just a bit more on the, uh, the higher range, I guess, than the normal reaction, because... It's hot. The planet's already hot, and then a volcano went off. Okay. Well, there was no volcano. A volcano will go off. Oh, I'm predicting go off. this. Oh, God. It's, there's constantly a volcano. Going. Yeah. Way. Okay. Right. And the next story. This is about how turning food into a weapon is one of the oldest forms of warfare. This is from Julian Borger in Washington. After failing to conquer Ukraine by conventional means, Russia tried an energy war, trying to hobble the power grid and freeze the nation into submission. Now it has launched a food war. The mining of the 
Kakovka Dam in June threatens to turn southern Ukrainian farmland into a dust bowl. Since Moscow pulled out of an UN broker deal to allow Ukraine grain exports to the Black Sea last month, it has announced a naval blockade of the country's ports and directly targeted food, destroying 220,000 tons of cereal awaiting export in silos. On the seacoast, Boston inland with attacks over the past two weeks on the Danube ports of Rennie and Ismail. The global cereal price index rose 10% in late July. After Russia torpedoed the Black Sea Grain Initiative, BSGI, blocking the route that carried 32 million tons over a year, more than half of Ukrainians' total grain exports. Some traders believe price will have risen by 20% by the end of the summer. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has appealed to Vladimir Putin to reconsider, but, but few involved in the grain business are optimistic that the deal can be revived. By turning food into a weapon, Russia has, Russia has resorted to one of the oldest forms of warfare. Ancient armies burned the grain, granaries of their foes to starve them into submission. In this case, Ukraine's economy has further damaged. It's fur, has been further damaged, and Russian exports have fetched higher prices. But the threat of starvation is thousands of miles away in the very poorest countries. That could be that could be pushed further towards famine by the higher prices and fewer humanita humanitarian deliveries. Ukraine provided half the wheat the World Food Program WFP, bought on global markets, which is shipped to people most in need in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, Sudan, and Yemen. It was good quality, cheap and quick to ship from Odessa through the Bosphorus into the Mediterranean, then through the Suez Canal to Yemen and the Horn of Africa. The WFP now has to buy grain at the highest price and transport it from port much further away. The WFP spokesperson, Steve Travella, said that the, without the Black Sea Initiative, the organization was really going to struggle to feed the same amount of people. Because of the historic levels of underfunding that the WFP has already had, they have short of a fund, the lack of which I have not seen in my 16 years. The WFP is either cutting the size of food rations given to individuals, or cutting the numbers of people it can feed, Travella said, adding that the people that the WFP was serving were already hanging on by a thread. Cindy McCain, Cindy McCain, WFP executive director, said families in the vulnerable countries struggling to survive were the collateral damage of the war. More than 50 nations are supplying arms to Ukraine, then quickly establishing a process and forum. The Ramstein format to coordinate deliveries, but so far there has been no concrete response for food security. Largely, that has been left to the market in piecemeal arrangements. The EU has announced solidarity lanes, overland rail, road, and inland waterway routes along the Ukraine that can export food. While Croatia has offered the use of its port in Rijeka, and the Baltic states have offered their own ports. However, westward lane routes are complicated and expensive. Ukraine inherited railway tracks from the Soviet Union that are wider than most of those in Europe, so goods have to be transferred to trains at the border. Pressure from their own farmers, five neighboring European countries have banned Ukrainian grain imports. Goods transitioning those to countries are in theory immune. There are still long lines of lorries held up on the Poland border by laborers' veterinary checks on livestock. Ah, the same thing the UK is dealing with. There is a discussion of creating green corridors that will allow Ukrainian exports to be transported without customs, sanitary, or veterinary checks until they reach their destination port, but that has yet to be agreed. The WFP has faced substantial costs shipping from Baltic or other Western European ports to Africa or Asia. We have contacts in many other places, but those contacts are likely to come at a price. It will probably take longer to get the places we need to go, and both those things mean that the people who need the food the most are going to suffer. There are likely to be more deaths from lack of food than there have been had this initiative continued. Ukraine has suggested that the excess should be paid by some international fund, but it's unclear whether the money, where the money would come from. Kory Lyov said that there is no good alternatives to the BSGI. The only one that made any economic sense was to use the Nanube River ports in Ukraine, Ismail and Reni, or in Romania at Gal Galati and Braila, where shipments could be loaded onto barges and ships. The vessels then pass through the three navigable channels of the Danube Delta or the two branches of the Danube Black Sea Canal further south for transfer to much bigger ocean-going freighters as the deep-water Romanian port of 
Constantanta able to accommodate the cargo ships of 50,000 tons. From there, the freighters could hug the coast, remaining safely within the Romanian, Bulgarian, and Turkish territory waters until they reached the Bosphorus Strait. Last year, the route accounted for about 20 million tons. In theory, with more investment, it could have a capacity of up to 35 million tons, more than the total exported through BSGI. The opening last month of a new 500 euro million bridge at Brelia could boost truck traffic to ports by up to 5 million tons a year. In practice, there are severe complications. More importantly, the Russians are aware that the New Bay route is a feasible alternative and are striving to cut it off. The drone strikes on Reni and Ismail in July and August destroyed warehouses and silos and the grains inside them, enough to feed 66 million people for a day. According to UN officials, the most significant impact has been the confidence of the ship crews and owners and insurers. We understand that insurers are quite reluctant to explore any movement of ships without Russian Federation guarantees, which is what the Black Sea Initiative provided. There are currently large traffic jams of ships off the coast from the Delta and Constanta, waiting for decisions on whether it's safe to proceed. Even there, in coastal waters, they face the dangers of mines and other floating debris left by blasting of the Kakova Dam. Air defenses could be mounted around the Ukrainian river port, but the Russians could attack in other ways. Two years ago, two river barges were sunk under mysterious circumstances. One Western European investigator said that the sinking was believed to be Ukrainian and Iranian authorities to be a trial run by Russian intelligence to assess how long it took to clear the river, in anticipation for further acts of sabotage. As well as security considerations, there are constraints on capacity. The New Bay Delta is congested, and some channels are narrow, are so narrow ships can only pass in one direction at a time. The canals can only take small ships and convoys of barges. There is also a shortage of vessels and crews, with rusting old barges being pulled into service along with retired river pilots. Tugboats and pusher crafts are operated in Romania by small cartel, and foreign firms have found it hard to enter the market. Given the complexity of the cost of the alternative routes to the BSGI, there are increasingly calls for coordinating body, a civilian Romstein format. Korolyov, the many Ukrainian officials, would like to see a special, specially created body address these problems. I see all the existing international institutes as being useless and amorphous, speaking, afraid to speak out against Russia, or do anything to stop Putin, he said. They don't carry out their duties. So far, the Biden administration has been very wary of such in institutional fixes. James O'Brien, head of the U.S. State Apart Department's Office of Sanctions Coordination, said, I don't believe a single entity is to answer for this. I think one of the things that works in the global food system is that we have thousands of smaller actors each pursuing a way to move grain around. Others argue that when Russia is treating food as a weapon of war, Ukraine, the West, and the world's hungry population will lose its its weight if it loot will lose if it waits for the market to solve the resulting crisis. The, the idea would be to enable the market to function, which isn't when one player is weaponizing and destroying one part of the system, said Fiona Hill, former senior director of the European and Russian Affairs at the U.S. National Security Council, who is now focused on food security at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. It's applying the same general rationale we took to dealing with energy and the crisis we confronted to resolve the war and applying it to grain and other food. So there you go. That's my very long article about how, oh, there's a problem, we could do this, or we could just wait for the market to fix it, because the market yeah. is totally a, a being with knowledge and thought. The mysterious market. Yeah, the market yeah. will fix it somehow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. In action via the market. Yeah. The market involves a lot of sailors and a lot of ships. Yep. All right, man, let's go with more tragedy. We have an assassination. This is a story from New York Times, Jose Maria Leon Cabrera, Julie Turkowitz, and Genevieve Glatsky. Reporting from Quito, Ecuador, a presidential candidate in Ecuador has been outspoken about the link between organized crime and government officials was assassinated on Wednesday evening at a political rally at the Capitol, just days before the election that was expected to be dominated by concerns over drug-related violence. The candidate, Fernando Villanvicenzo, 
Villain B. Cienzo, a former journalist, was gunned down outside a high school in Quito after speaking to young supporters. When he stepped outside the door, he was met with gunfire, said Carlos Figueroa, who, who worked for Mr. Villavicenzo's campaign and was at the rally. There was nothing to be done because there were shots to the head. Mr. Villavicenzo, 59, was polling near the middle of an eight-person race. He was among the most vocal candidates on the issue of crime and state corruption. It was the first assassination of a presidential candidate in Ecuador and came less than a month after the mayor of Manta, a port city, was shot to death during a public appearance. Ecuador, once a relatively safe nation, has been consumed by violence related to narco trafficking in the last five years. Outraged and shocked by the assassination, President Guillermo Lasso wrote on a social media platform, X, formerly known as Twitter. Oh, we gotta keep saying this now. We gotta say X formerly known as Twitter. Please stop doing this to me. Late Wednesday, blaming the death on or- organized crime. I'm taking a personal. Just, yeah, I'm gonna I'm say just, Twitter. I'm just gonna say social media. That's yeah. it. National Prosecutor's Office said an hour later on the same platform that a suspect had been shot and apprehended amid crossfire. The security forces had died shortly afterward. Nine other people were shot in the melee, according to a prosecutor's office, according to police officers and a candidate for the National Assembly seat. The killing shocked the nation already suffering deep economic, social, and political upheaval. Ecuador, on South America's western edge, witnessed an extraordinary transformation between 2005 and 2015 as millions of people rose out of poverty riding to the wave of an oil boom whose profits were poured into education, healthcare, and social programs. But more recently, the country has been transformed by increasingly powerful narco-trafficking industry with the foreign drug mafias joining forces with local prison and street gangs unleashing a wave of violence unlike anything the country's reached in history. Homicide rates are at record levels. Today, the violence is often horrific and public, meant to induce fear and ext- exert control. There are regular reports of car bombings, beheading, and children being gunned down outside their schools. To complicate the situation, Mr. Lasso disbanded the country's opposition-led National Assembly in May, a drastic move he made as he faced impeachment proceedings over accusations of embezzlement. The move, which is allowed under the Constitution, meant that new elections for president and legislative representatives were held. The vote in which Mr. Villan Villa Vicencio was supposed to compete is set for August 20th. He had worked with a, as a journalist, activist, and legislator, gained prominence as opponent of Carismo, the leftist movement of former President Rafael Correra, who served from 07 to 2017 and still holds political sway in Ecuador. In 17, he successfully ran for a seat in the National Assembly where he served until the legislature was dissolved by Mr. Lasso and not Ted Lasso. (laughs) And this is the story of the assassination. Another tragic (laughs) Thursday event. Let's try not to make this a regular thing. (laughs) Say what? It's like a random side joke. Not Ted Lasso. Mr. Lasso, not Ted Lasso. That... What is it, HBO or whatever? I, I have no idea. So, I, I heard about I, it. I never watched it. I don't have the all the cable stuff, so I'm I'm clueless. I know it's a football coach trying to coach English football, and he's yeah. clueless. And the premise lost me immediately, but so. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, two different sports. Stu- yeah. Nobody's that. Stu- nobody's that stupid. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. They're Anyways. stretching credibility. It's me. Anyway, it's totally unrelated to an assassination. Your story. The next article is going to be about cats and getting the Ooh. anti-COVID pill. This is from Helena Smith in Athens. Veterinarian services in Cyprus have received a first batch of anti-COVID pills from a stockpile originally meant for humans as efforts intensify to stop the spread of the virulent strain of feline coronavirus that has killed thousands of cats. Reminder, coronavirus can be transmitted between different animal species, so you should be taking care of your animals and not just yourself, because they can also spread it to other people. The island's health ministry began discharging the treatment on August 8th, long celebrated as International Cat Day, 
Wow, that's fitting. It well, it's hoped to be... Oh, yeah, that was yesterday. That, that was International Cat Day on August 8th. Yeah, we talked about that. Mm-hmm. And what hoped, and they that's when they started discharging the treatment on International Cat Day. So fitting. Right on. It was hoped to it, it is in what is hoped to be the beginning of the end of the disease that has struck the Mediterranean country's feline population. We have taken stock of 500 boxes of medication. Christodulius Pepis, the government's veterinary service director, told The Guardian. This is the first batch of 2,000 packages that we made available. Each one contains 40 capsules, so we are talking about a total of 80,000 pills. Distribution of the drug follows an alarming increase in Cyprus of cases of feline infection peritoneus, or FIP, caused by feline coronavirus, coronavirus, which, if left untreated, is almost always fatal. Defined as the FCOV-23 outbreak, the virus was first noticed in January in Nicosia, the Cypriot capital. Within three to four months, it was spread across the whole island, according to the Pan-Cyprian Veterinary Association, or the PVA. Experts at the University of Edinburgh investigated the outbreak in collaboration with PVA and found that within 12 weeks, the number of FIP cases confirmed by PCR, Polly Murray's chain reaction test, rose 20-fold compared with the previous year. Dr. Charlampios Atipa senior lecturer in veterinary clinical pathology, who is heading the University of Edinburgh team, said, Our studies are very much focused on identifying the possible mutation that has led to this highly virulent strain. Although the mutated feline virus is not related to COVID-19, it cannot be contracted by humans. Molni Piravir, the active ingredients in anti-COVID pills, has provided to be beneficial to cats diagnosed with FIP. Dead in the species of infected cats and then spread through contact, feline coronavirus was first recorded in the 1960s. Outbreaks of FIP, though rare, have previously occurred in the UK, US, Taiwan, Greece, but were always combined in catteries. In Cyprus, the virus appears to have assumed a much more virulent infection form, infectious form with even out indoor only pets falling victim. The co- this country is a slaughterhouse for animal. Well, Cecilia Gregoriou, an assistant professor in the education department of the University of Cyprus, who lost her elderly indoor cat to the disease last weekend. Yes, the government has made this announcement, this little framework, but it's very contradictory because there's nothing nothing is being done for the cats here. Instead, there is a policy of thanatopolitics, an economy of death, which is how the slaughterhouse works. In reality, they would rather let them die. Wow, this person's very still grieving you can tell they're still grieving the island's cat pop P- protection and welfare society pause recently made the dramatic claim that about 300,000 felines both domesticated and stray had perished as a result of the gal scheme fip transmission rates since january local veterinarians veterinarians describe the figure as an exaggeration putting its instead at the 80,000 deaths in the first half of 2023, but had not disputed the severity of the outbreak. It's just not true that we are an island of dead cats. But what is happening is very serious, said the PVA president, Nekataria Yano Arsenlenglu, adding that effect- afflicted animals could be nursed back to health in both the wet and dry forms of the illness if given the proper treatment. We're very happy that the drug has now been improved. It will give people the ability to treat their cats and so much more can be saved. And it will me- definitely make a difference. Other antivirals on the market had been prohibitively expensive. Our main therapeutic goal since January has been to have a treatment plan that would be more widely available at the costs were so high. There's a problem and cases are increasing. Last week, when the cabinet announced it would all allow part of the island's Republic official stock of human coronavirus medication to be used, cat lovers rejoiced because the anti-COVID pills were so much more affordable. Each pack will cost 100 euros, said Peepees, noting that by the end of the week, the first batch of drugs would be distributed to veterinary centers across five districts. 100 packages will be delivered to each dist- district. Cat owners who have a prescription from a vet will be eligible to buy it. The EU's most, the EU's most easterly state, Cyprus, is famed for its prophylic feline population. Legend has, it, legend has it that cats were introduced by Saint Helena, the mother of the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great. Who ordered they be sent in from Palestine and Egypt to rid the island of venomous snakes? Atiba said 
that given the UK's traditionality, traditionally close ties with former colony, it was vital that the restrictions were placed on cats traveling to and from Cyprus while the case of the outbreak was being researched. Scientists at the University of Edinburgh are in the process of sequencing the viral strain. The outbreak provides a unique opportunity to study and sequence the feline coronavirus in great depth, and the findings will be beneficial for all cats globally, Atipa said. So yay! The cats will be saved. They won't die of their own feces. Yay! Some happy they news. Make, they can make that movie Isle of Cats now. Yeah, Isle of Cats. Isle of Cats. And um, actually, it's the, the World Day of the Lion. I just looked it up. So. Oh, cool. More we'll cats. get to that later. Okay, in sad news, and this this uh, copy is written by me. I'm going to start re writing my own copy, I think, just so I can pronounce the words. Because uh, I mouth doesn't work in the morning. <clears throat> Here you go. Up on Cripple... <clears throat> Here we go, one more time. Up on Cripple Creek, she sends me. If I spring a leak, she mends me. I don't have to speak. She defends me. A drunkard's dream, if I ever did see one. It was... Virtual, virtuoso Garth Hudson's clavinet that hooked my ear and everyone's to up on Cripple Creek. Then it was Levon Helms, Arkansas, gravelly truck driver, seen it all voice and delivery that spun the tale. But the lyrics, the clever homespun lyrics, were written by a Jewish Mohawk from Canada. Robbie Robertson passed away yesterday at the age of 80. With him went the curiosity and art of a brilliant mind. Robbie wrote at least three masterpieces, and yes, the band deserved credit for turning them into classics, and Joan Baez had her biggest hit with one, even though she mangled the lyrics. The night they tore old Dixie down was an instant Americana anthem, a Canadian identifying with the defeated Southern poor. Even this Yankee can be brought down by the verse of Virgil Cain lamenting not only the loss of any identity, but we are later to find out the death of his 18 year old brother. Now I don't mind chopping wood and I don't care if the money's no good. You take what you need and you leave the rest, but they never should have taken the very best. Robbie Robertson wrote that. He also wrote The Weight with its five verses of good intentions getting rewarded by additional obligations. As with Cripple Creek, the lyrics are fun and in this case, literally devilish. The second verse, I picked up my bags and went looking for a place to hide. And I saw Carmen and the devil walking side by side. I said, hey, Carmen, come on, let's go downtown. She said, I got to go, but my friend can stick around. The band, <clears throat> excuse me, the band changed popular music. They started in, as Arkansas rockabilly singer Rodney Hawkins' backup band in the early 1960s. Ronnie's band was only touring Canada and members began to quit. Hawkins started hiring Canadians. His first hire was 16-year-old Robbie Robertson, who, who with drummer Levon Helm began to recruit local Canadian talent and soon formed the Hawks, a name they were still using after they outgrew Rockabilly and Hawkins. It was around that around that time that they came to the attention of Bob Dylan, who would need an electric band and tour to tour in support of all of his new electric material. What followed was a legendary world tour of concerts dominated by booing folky audiences as they felt betrayed by Dylan. Robertson appeared on Dylan albums starting with Blonde on Blonde and after Dylan's motorcycle accident, the band rented a house near Woodstock, New York called Big Pink. Dylan was living nearby with his wife and small children. The band, who by now had adopted that name for their recording sessions, started recording songs in a small tape recorder with Dylan at Big Pink. A voluminous, a volu I can't even, I can't even read my own uh, words. A voluminous amount of songs that Dylan was writing just to publish. These songs were bootlegged and eventually became known as the Basement Tapes. The band's output, the band's output from Big Pink became music from Big Pink, a universally renowned album. No album at the time sounded anything like it. It was a roots music played with sincerity and full, full of stories and a couple of Dylan covers. Rick Danko on bass, Carth Hudson on keyboards and many other instruments. Rick Manuel on pain, Rich Manuel on piano. The drummer Helm 
as a featured vocalist along with Danko and Manuel. The influence was broad and immediate. Eric Clapton quit his power trio Cream almost immediately and wanted to become Robbie Robertson. I looked this up. Music from Big Pink was released on July 1st, 1968. Eric Clapton announced he was leaving Cream on July 10th. <laughs> so Eric Clapton in a, in, a, in a documentary claimed, I left Cream after I heard the band. That's what he says. Some of Robert, Robbie's very best songs weren't hits, but histories. King Harvest celebrates the harvest of losing your crops to drought and having to sell the farm for a union job. Acadian Driftwood brought to light Canada's tragic treatment of French-speaking Acadians on the eastern coast after what we call the French and Indian War in 1755. They set them adrift where many of the survivors ended up in Louisiana and the Caribbean. The band released several al albums and eventually went on to tour with Dylan again in 1974 and toured on their own until 1976 as the band, culminating in the Martin Scorsese-directed The Last Waltz concert movie filmed in San Francisco. Members of the band would reunite many times in the decades that followed, but Robertson never rejoined the group. He recorded music for the soundtracks of Scorsese films like Raging Bull, The Color of Money, and released a handful of solo albums, his last cinematic with an S, came out in 2019. Robertson is the fourth member of the band to die. Following Richard Manuel in 1986, Rick Danko in 99, and vocalist drummer Lee Von Helm in 2012. Keyboardist and organist Garth Hudson is now the group's only living member. Before he was Robbie Robertson, the future rock star was born Jaime Royal Robertson, the son of a Mohawk mother who was raised on the Six Nations Reserve in Ontario. He learned later in life that his biological father, Alexander Klagerman, was a Jewish member of the Toronto Underworld who was known for gambling. And his, his father died before he was born in a car accident, so he was raised by a man named Robertson. Your story, the sad passing of a rock legend. The Don't UK philanthropist anyway. gives almost 29 million to heritage skills training. This is from Dahlia Albridge on The Guardian. A British philanthropist has given almost 29 million pounds to heritage skills training, breathing new life into dying crafts and addressing the chronic shortage of specialists who can prevent historic buildings from deteriorating beyond repair. Hamish Augston's donation, which has been made through his charitable foundation, will be announced on Thursday. It is the largest private single commitment to the heritage training cause and will enable up to 2,700 new heritage conservative apprentices and trainees to learn century-old techniques. Historic England listed almost 5,000 building and sites on its 2022 Heritage of At-Risk Register. It has previously warned of further deterioration and without training a new generation of craftspeople with heritage skills. Carpentry, plastering, roofing, and stonemasonry are among traditional crafts that differ from modern construction methods. The sector has also long warned that many vital skills are at risk of being lost forever. The endangered registered of the Heritage Crafts Association lists barely a handful of specialists in flint napping, the shaping of flint for masonry. The funding will go to English Heritage, Historic Environment Scotland, the Commonwealth Heritage Forum, and the Cathedral's Workshop Fellowship while supporting everything from hands-on practical work to learning how to create financially sustainable historic attractions for the general public. English Heritage alone will receive $11.2 million, which will enable a groundbreaking and apprenticeship program that will save the skills of flint working from extinction. It will start by establishing a training center in East Anglia with more than 50 apprenticeship roles as well as traineeships. It means that the future of the 34 flint castles and abbeys in the east of England will be safeguarded. Support from the Hamish Oxton Foundation will now allow English Heritage apprentices to work directly at the Bacon's Thorpe Castle, a landmark site in North Norfolk that is currently closed due to high level of failure of masonry. Without the comprehensive repair, it would be at risk. Similarly, they will also they will be able to work on mainly the 14th century remains of Lyston Abbey, among Suffolk's most impressive monastic ruins. Using flint and stone, the site is now highly vulnerable with large areas currently fenced off. Masonry flint napper Duncan Barry of Barry Stonework in Chichester, West Sussex, welcomed the funding news, saying that it is the 
this is a, a big shortage of flint nappers, although he would want to train more if he had the space. We're inundated with people wanting to learn. He added that there is a huge demand for flint work, both for historic and contemporary buildings. Flint has been used from the earliest structures. Every Roman building used flint, so it's been used as a building material ever since they worked out what they could stick things together with lime mortars. We can stick these together! Hey! It is amazing building material because it's actually carbon neutral as well. You just pick it off the field and stack it up. The funding will also enable a scheme for stonemasonry students at Durham, Durham, Gloucester, Canterbury Cathedrals, learning how the very best heritage professionals. Robert Bargery, the heritage project director at the Hamish Augstone Foundation, said the charity was addressing a skills deficit. Apart from helping historic buildings that need help, and it is particularly particularly reaching out to people from deprived parts of the country among other possible recruits. There could be some very good people who need a bit of a leg up. The point of this program is to help them do that. Actively go out and encourage people to look at heritage skills they might not otherwise have thought about as a career. No, I totally get that because these days, what are the jobs that is most pushed towards you? The ones that you need to go to university for eight years for, right? Mm -hmm. Doctor, a lawyer, blah, blah. You know there's people out there who do work that don't require... You know, I don't want to say Just intelligence, because they definitely require intelligence. What a different type of intelligence, right? They require, they require apprenticeships. Yeah. Just to practice at it. Get good yeah. at it, that's all. Yeah. yeah. Austin, a former businessman, has bequeathed his entire fortune to his foundation, established in 2019 to support health, heritage, and music. He said an ecosystem of heritage conservation expertise was needed to ensure the survival of some of the greatest historical buildings. With this new funding, we hope to establish just an ecosystem so that more young people, no matter who they are or where they come from, can access the unique opportunities of career in heritage conservation. Yay! Isn't that nice? All those glorious castles in the UK aren't going to collapse gonna under crumble. weather and the heat. Very important. Heritage. Remember the past so you don't repeat it, hopefully. <laughs> and some good news on Tragic Thursday, which we needed. You can't just be drowning in tragedy. Yeah. Well, back to tragedy this, <laughs> this day in history, <laughs> <laughs> which is usually tragedy. It's hard to say. Well, not always. It's birthdays, a lot of it. Okay, this day in 1729, William Howe, the fifth got Viscount Howe, commander in chief of the British Army in North America in 1776 to 78, who failed to destroy the Continental Army and stem the American Revolution, was born. So happy birthday, William Howe. And when they asked him how the war was, they, had, they would usually ask him, how did you manage to lose? <laughs> <laughs> ah, boy. 1793, the Louvre opened in Paris and later became the most visited museum in the world. In 1815, Ganoida Seneca, chief and founder of the Longhouse religion, died in Onanga, On, Onondaga, New York. There you go. Seneca chief died this day, 1815. 1846, the Smithsonian Institution was founded in Washington, D.C. by the U.S. Congress with funds bequeathed by English scientist James Smithson. In 1914, France declared war on Austria-Hungary in World War I. In 1950, Sunset Boulevard, considered one of Hollywood's greatest film, had its world premiere and the film Noir is especially noted for Gloria Swanson's portrayal of a fading movie star, Nora Desmond. I, I remember her name. That's, a, that's how impactful that movie is. 1970, American musician Jim Morrison, lead singer of The Doors, went on trial in Florida, charged with various crimes after allegedly exposing himself during a Miami concert. 1969, he was later found guilty, and then a little bit later than that, found dead. Uh-oh. Yeah, well, it's Jim Morrison. 1977, American serial killer David Berkowitz was arrested after murdering six people in New York City and plunging the city into a panic. He later confessed and was sentenced to 365 years in prison, of which he wow. has probably eh, around 300 of them left. 
1993, American jurist Ruth Gator Bins Ruth Gator Binsberg, I can't speak. Let's do this again. American jurist Ruth Bader Ginsburg was sworn in as Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, becoming the second woman to serve on the court, which now has four women. 2008, American singer-songwriter Isaac Hayes, a pioneering fi figure in social music whose recordings influenced the development of such musical genres as disco and rap and urban contemporary, died on this day at the age of 65. And of course, he was also a chef on South Park <laughs> as his oh, last yeah. gig. That was his last okay. gig. 1792 is our featured event. Louis the 16th of France was in prison. That's right. As the French Revolution continued, the country's monarchy was effectively overthrown on this day in 1792 when King Louis the 16th and his wife, Marie Antoinette, were in prison and eventually guillotine like reading it like a sports guy <laughs> born and i'm um, dying on august 10th on uh 1923 age 60 in cecil cecil dia spain was joaquin sorala batista spanish painter so famously died 100 years ago today. Famous birthdays, 1962, Suzanne Collins, American author and screenwriter was born. 1960, Antonio Banderas, Spanish born actor and director was born. 1951, Juan Manuel Santos, president of Colombia was born. 1909, Leo Fender, very important American inventor and manufacturer of electric guitars. Hey. And in 1874, Herbert Hoover, President of the United States, was born. And what day is it? Do you want to know what day it is besides National oh, World Lion Day? We've already got it is Agent Orange Awareness Day. No, Agent yeah. Orange is not it, he's not a secret agent. He's not a spy. He, agent Orange was a defoliant that we spread on crops and it causes all kinds of horrible diseases and birth defects national connecticut day so if you're living in connecticut woo Yay. it's national <laughs> it's national s'mores day hey bonfire s'mores day. day so yeah if you're in connecticut eating s'mores you're doing the right thing and it's national lazy day and if you're too lazy to make s'mores you're also doing the right thing <laughs> <laughs> And it's World Lion Day, and lions are known, especially the male lions, for being extremely, what is that? Lazy. Lazy. <laughs> Lazy. <laughs> so it's National Shapewear Day. Also, are you so, are you insecure about your body? Wear this extra set of clothes that will put all your fat rolls into a really tight suit, I guess. Yeah, you said 100 degrees of 90% humidity. Here's another layer of clothing for you. <laughs> But at least you Amen. look really great in that dress. And that's the way the cookie crumbles on this day. All right, this has been Allison here. Not feeling as sick as yesterday. And I she probably will do yoga today instead of yesterday where as soon as I got off before coffee, I basically passed out. <laughs> <laughs> so today I have stuff to do and I feel much better just sweat it out and uh, I'm gonna go eat some s'mores I guess and celebrate Connecticut and uh, here's Roger gonna play a lot of band music the band music yeah today you know stage fright all that uh, just some a lot of great songs I didn't even mention and you know the band again just the band that's all you got to say and that actually the only band that actually could have ever had that name because they just didn't have necessarily how many bands does a front man the guitar player who doesn't sing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, Robbie Robertson was a legit I mean the, the drummer was the singer, the the main singer. That's not yeah. very common either. So anyway, we'll talk to you later on August 10th, 2023, edition of Before Coffee. Be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons. Follow our other channels, Toxic Alley, History of Gravy, and Scratchy Old Records. <laughs>